Well, welcome back to the big board. I thought what might be fun is to have a look at a feed of arms, one of the scenarios from it, from Lock and Load Publishing. It uh, is an expansion for Heroes of the Falklands. And if you're familiar with that particular system, it's tactical, squad level, and to my mind, one of the most enjoyable tactical gaming systems out there from the perspective that it's both beautiful to look at and to interact with from a from a art perspective and component perspective and also from a, uh, a usability perspective as well. <clears throat> so the user interface is, is very convenient and uh, well presented. But more than that, it's the gameplay is also pretty fast and furious. It's a classic I go, you go system. It's got a little bit of Hollywood going on. So, you know, it's not at the far right end spectrum of uh, completeness and uh, OCD detail that is the part of uh, the ASL culture, which, you know, it's all good and has its place. And there's lots of guys who love that. And that's fantastic. But nor is it down at the Memoir 44 end of you know fungible scale with blocks and you know four inch hexes and all this sort of silliness so it uh, and, and i have no qualms with memoir 44 either it has its place just as command and colors has its place they're fun light games to play but if you want to play modern or world war ii but in particular for me modern uh, tactical combat this is the place to be with this system so it's interesting that after a long, long time, I mean, uh, you know, the original release of whew, of uh, Heroes of the Gap was what it was called originally. Uh, uh, that was the most recent modern title that was released. There were a couple of interim bits and pieces that came in, some of the Line of Fire magazines, some Somali action and some Delta Force guys and bits and pieces, but nothing really substantial like this is substantial. It's Two or three maps, I think. I forget how many maps come in it. Uh, and a dozen scenarios. <clears throat> and a couple of those scenarios are uh, reboots of the originals with a more historical, historically accurate uh, order of battle, position and location for forces, and updated uh, success criteria or, or, or business objectives, business objectives. Really. I'm thinking about work at the back of my mind. I've got a crazy week coming up this week. That sucks. Victory conditions is what I was trying to say. All right. So what I thought we would do is while I've been blathering on, you've probably had a chance to have a look at this here, the battle, uh, this particular battle here, Operation Rosario, which is the the uh, Argentine name for this particular amphibious landing, which is the which kicked off hostilities in essence, and uh, on the land anyway. And what I thought we'd do is now that you've had a chance to have a look at this, and if you haven't, you can pause the video here and have a look, and then we'll keep going. We've got uh, two OBs right here. Uh, some other stuff that comes on later on. One thing I do have a question about is I, I have either lost one of these, which is weird given that I have at least, I have more than one copy of this game, uh, or or there's, there's one short for this particular scenario because it requires two. But I thought we'd have a look at the initial Commonwealth or British defense and have a discussion about why I'm doing what I'm doing with the view that we will be, you know, then looking at what the offensive opportunities might be for the Argentine forces. So we'll take, take it from there. Okay. Sorry for the squeaky seat. So the vigil conditions the Argentine player must control all six hexes of government house, which is on map 69, which is this map. That's B2, this basically this building. Upstairs and downstairs, and uh, any other, any of our outcome, outcome results in a British victory. In in the original game, uh, the house was situated way way over here, type of thing, 
and it made uh, it made for a, a, a rush and a dash to capture the house with substantially less forces in that house, mind you. And it was always very difficult for the Argentinians to win unless they got particularly lucky with a good law shot on the building that that uh, you know suppressed or or shook one of the enemy, <clears throat> one of the British guys. In this particular situation, we've got forces landing right here. We've potentially got forces coming in from the left. And we have definitely have uh, units coming in uh, from the right-hand side of the map, which is going to be on turn three. I'm just trying to look here in two LVTPs. That's the uh, two LVTPs that I need to get folks uh, get folks ho hooking along here. And so when you look at the forces, we've got our static defense, basically. We've got to keep, this, keep control of this area. So any units that come in this way, there's some rules to prevent a lot of op fire until you're fired upon or something of something of that nature there's a bunch of special rules in this particular game movement restrictions and whatnot but that's not necessarily that important but what what is important is how we're going to situate ourselves here so what i've elected to do is on the ground floor put a, a law in this building along with the sniper on the upper lips on the upper level let's turn that around anyway and then on the upper level here, uh, this also allows us to shoot out, right? And defend this way. I've got a medic, a crew member, and a, uh, a squad of Brits. They're basically Royal Marines. And then you've got a commander here with a machine gun, uh, a squad and a machine gun unit also upstairs. And then I've put one unit all the way out, outside because he's within range. He doesn't have to be in a building. It says that here very clearly. We're going to put this guy outside. And I'm going to use him as sort of like a, a, a quick response force, a QRF force. Even though he's got to jump over the fence and come into the building, he may be able, able to assault into the ground floor and cause all sorts of drama. Plus, he may actually be able to, uh, you know, interdict or interfere with anything that comes from the left-hand side of the map. And I'm just looking here to see, yeah, 70B, E4, E5. E4, E5 is all the way over here. And that is going to be four, three, three, four units. This must be a long scenario. Yeah, eight turns. They're going to have to. They're going to have to hustle, right? So that means uh, once I get a chance to move, I could get up into this hex here, which has a great defensive strength of plus three because it's sort of rocky terrain, <clears throat> and we could cause all sorts of trouble here for the Argentinians that are coming from the left-hand side of your screen. That would make them come further down this way instead of coming directly towards government house if I can put this guy in here subject to the movement restrictions we'll see in the meantime over on the right hand side of the map as soon as these guys are able to be moved they can start attacking along the flank here or they can uh, move into some locations here to prevent these forces that are coming from the right hand side of the map from just rushing down at 12 movement points a turn into the township and causing all sorts of mayhem. I put these guys, while they can start in here, I put them here. And I'm going to have to double check the movement rules to see if this is a, indeed a, a wise idea to put them in this building right here. But they, they've got good two good fields of fire. The enemy is going to come past here on either side. We don't know which. I've got a Gustav Law, the Carl Gustav Law type of unit there it's got a range of th a good range of three at the very least I'll I'll be in a position to dash off down to here uh, by the time that these other forces start heading this way if I can get myself released I'll just have to check right it says here that the units that are set up in in and around government house can't move beyond their setup area so there's there's a downer uh, the detachment that begins the scenario on map 68B, which is these guys, cannot move until 
either turn five or they've taken a damage check or after they score a hit with a Carl Gustav. So there you go. Whichever occurs first. The detachment that begins the scenario on 69N1, which I think is going to be these guys over here, can't move until either turn three or a British unit in government house takes a damage check, whichever occurs first. So that's two interesting little little lockdowns for for them. Uh, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to seem to me that perhaps this little fella here, whoops, pardon me, this little fella here, probably not wise. Units that set up in and around government house cannot move beyond their setup area. Okay, so I could move back into here. This is probably not a wise idea to, uh, we're not about to get him over here. So we should probably put him downstairs somewhere to make life difficult for the bad guys. We'll put him here and we'll put these guys on the upper level. So now there's two combats they'll have to have to conduct to get up the stairs and get those final those final two hexes. So that's kind of the way I look at my defensive posture for this particular scenario. We'll see how it all plays out. Now we'll get the Argentinian forces out and we'll have a look at them and see what we can potentially do with them based on what any rules that they may have that will give them some advantages or disadvantages as the case might be. Thanks for tuning in. Talk to you soon.